days that have been wounded and church splits, we'd ask, Lord God, that you would help them to find a little bit of healing this day as they study your word from 1 Corinthians. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what is your fighting style? Uh, I'm not talking about fist fighting or slapping or kicking or biting. But when you get into a disagreement with another person, how do you handle that disagreement? What is your style of fighting against another person? Uh, there's a very famous story that I like to read to my kids when they're younger. It's from this little book. Anybody recognize this book? Okay. It is about... What are these two guys? Anybody know who they are? The Zaps. That's right. There's a north-going Zap, and there's a south-going Zap. And let me read you from Dr. Seuss. And it happened that both of them came to a place where they bumped and they stood foot to foot, face to face. Look here now, the north-going Zap said, I say, you're blocking my path, you're right in my way. I'm a north-going Zach, and I always go north. Get out of my way now, and let me go forth. Who's in whose way, snapped the south-going Zach? I always go south, always south-going tracks. So you're in my way, and I ask you to move. Let me go south on my south-going groove. And the north-going Zach and the south-going Zach got into a dispute, because one was blocking the other. And this is what is happening in the church of Corinth. There's a dispute going on between different cliques in the church. And each one wanted to go its own way and be blocked by the other group. And when this happens in a church, some really terrible things can take place. And so today as we are going through our study of 1 Corinthians, we're going to be looking at this part about a church split. So if you can, take out your sermon notes for today. Uh, take a look at them. And uh, look at the quote. This is from the class that we are having here called Resolving Everyday Conflicts. And neat little quote. Uh, Ken says, What are you really living for? It's critical to realize that you're either glorifying God or you're glorifying something or someone else. You're always making something look big. If you don't glorify God when you're involved in a conflict, you inevitably show that someone or someone thing else rules your heart. And so the big idea I want to get into your mind is this. When you're involved in a conflict, your goal is not to win. Your goal is to glorify God. And imagine how that would change the conflicts you're in. Instead of trying to win, you are here to glorify God. Instead of the Zacks trying to win who's going to go north and who's going to go south, imagine if their goal was to bring glory to God. It changes the equation. It changes the situation. And uh, look in your sermon notes. And, uh, in our Resolving Everyday Conflict class, they have a children's edition. And so this is the kids' version of what we studied last week. Blessed are the peacemakers. And notice there's an arch there. And your goal is to glorify God and stay on top of that arch and not fall to either side. Because so often when we are involved in conflicts, we fall to the left side and we try to escape the conflict. We deny it's going on. We blame other people. We run away. Or even worse, we fall to the right and we begin to attack. We put people down and call them names. We gossip behind their backs and we fight. And where God wants us to be is on top of that arch, to work out the conflict. And sometimes we have to overlook it in Christian love. Sometimes we have to talk about it. And sometimes we need help. So let's study from the book of 1 Corinthians and see how Paul is handling a church that is in turmoil. So a congregation in trouble for all you confirmation kids, fill in the blanks. Uh, let's read the first part together, ready? Right? I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, and that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. And as I said before, we have a picture here of Corinth, and this is Greece. And notice where Corinth is. There's Athens over here, and then a whole big part of Greece over here. 
And so again, trade would go from Athens to this part of Greece, from that part of Greece back to Athens. And instead of sailing all the way around that part of Greece, they would take their ships to where the Corinth is and transfer their cargo over the isthmus that is there. And so Corinth 2,000 years ago was famous, as I said, for its wealth, extremely wealthy. It was famous for its athletic games, and it's famous for its vice and immorality. And so in Corinth, it was all about winning, winning in business, winning in sports, winning in the most vice you could fit into your life. And these people were being called to a different way of life, being called into the church. Yet as they entered the church, they brought with them this bad winning attitude. Uh, if you look at a 1A, the situation, Paul sees cracks in the unity of the church in Corinth. He knew the church would soon split. So he wrote a letter encouraging the Corinthians to reconcile, to leave their selfish desires and renew their vows of commitment by cleaving to each other in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word division is schism in this Greek text, which means to rip or to tear apart. And I'm not going to have you raise hands, but I have a funny feeling that some of you have been part of churches that have had schism, churches that have been torn apart. And what did it feel like when you saw your church being torn apart? Was it a happy, wonderful feeling? No, it's a terrible thing to be a, with a bunch of Christians and see them either running away or attacking each other and not dealing with the issues in love, not thinking about how to bring glory to God. And this problem that's taking place in Corinth took place in other early churches. Uh, the book of Philippians, we have two women, you can see there, that are in disagreement, and Paul pleads with them to agree with each other. And so this life one is very important. Have you ever fought to win without regard to giving glory to God? And think how often in your own disagreements you are fighting to win. You are like those two zats trying to get your way instead of trying to glorify God. Paul wanted this church in Corinth not to be known for its fighting, but to be known for its love and its faith and its hope that it gives glory to God. So go down under a B of your sermon notes, another good quote from our Resolving Everyday Conflict class. When you draw on God's grace to put off your what? Self-centered attitudes. And that's what gets us in trouble. And act on His principles. You put His glory on display. Your life points to Him, to His vast wisdom, compassion, transforming power. And as you look for God's glory, the impact reaches far beyond yourself because you give everyone around you a reason to respect and praise God. Glorifying God is not about letting others see how great you are. It's about letting them see how great, who is? The Lord is. And so we're doing this really cool class. Uh, if you cannot make the class, we do have a book that covers everything called Resolving Everyday Conflict. I'd uh, be glad to come up and uh, get one after church, but the class is just really, really good. So Paul is asking this church to agree, to be complete in Jesus. And I like that quote under C. He wants in the attitude of what? Flexibility and oneness. Isn't that a combination? Flexibility and oneness. To have some flexibility with the people that are around you that are different than you and yet be one in Jesus. So let's see if we as a church, right here, right now, can be one in Jesus. Let's see if we can agree upon four basic principles of the church. Uh, go look at that life point. Can we all agree that Jesus calls us to change the world by changing one part at a time with the message of the cross? Is that something we can all agree on? I hope so. How about number two? We are here to make disciples of Jesus. Can we agree upon that? Yes, and uh, by the way, one of the best ways to make disciples is by getting them as children. And this is why our Awanas program is so, so important. We're making disciples of these little kids. Why our preschool and school is so important. We are making disciples of those kids. Why senior high youth group and junior high youth group is so important. 
or continue to shape these kids to be disciples and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Can we agree upon that? Yes. yes. You confess your sins and you believe. A disciples' life is seen as they love God and love others and serve the world. Can we agree upon that? Yes. And so we are united. We are a church. And we have things that we agree upon. But there will be things that we do not always agree upon. And so we try to work it out. Sometimes overlooking, sometimes talking, sometimes getting help in the situation. So move on to a part two and let's see what the problem was with this church. And the problem was the church was divided into little cliques. And let me read this to you. Or it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there's quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is this. That one of you says, I follow Paul, another I follow Apollos, another I follow Cephas, and another I follow Christ. So who were these little cliques? These little cliques that were divided at the church. Well, Paul's little clique were Gentile believers. Paul specialized in bringing Gentiles to faith in Jesus. The other little clique were Apollos' party. And in Acts chapter 18, you learn that he's very eloquent. And so these are Greek intellectuals who are believers. Cephas' party is Aramaic for Peter. These are Jewish Christians. And then there's the Christ party. And this group is a group of people who thought they were better than other Christians. Ever run across a person like that? If only you could be like me and have my spirituality, then you'd be a real Christian. Okay, so you have these different little groups, these different little cliques in the church. And they are fighting with each other. And they are driving the church apart. And the problem is they didn't remember a very key doctrine. Look at down that light point at number A. Who holds the key to your heart? When we are saved, our sin nature does not disappear. They just get a new roommate, the Holy Spirit. So the roommates constantly wrestle for possession of the prized property, our hearts. The problem with the Corinthians was that they were letting the old roommate win the battle, leaving the new one unsupported and ignored. And so in all these different groups, the focus was on themselves, upon me, not upon Jesus, not upon giving glory to God. And part of this is having a misplaced focus. So go down to a B of your sermon notes. So which one of these are you? Where is your focus in life? Is it A, you fix your eyes on things, that you want more and more stuff? And will more and more stuff make you happy? No, you're just going to have more and more stuff. That's it. Is your focus upon your situation and you're happy and you're sad, depending upon how your situation is going? That's a bad focus. How about you can have the eyes upon yourself and you have what is called ingrown eyeballitis? Anybody have ingrown eyeballitis? <laughs> Okay, you've met people like that. Uh, number four is interesting. Focused upon others, but in a wrong way. You've lifted up people as idols, and they're objects of worship. Your gaze is to be upon the Lord. And now it's the time for you guys to grab a Bible, or bring your own Bible. We'd like you to bring your own Bible to church. And open up to Hebrews chapter 12. And Hebrews is kind of difficult to find. It's way near the end of the Bible. The Bible has Old and New Testament. In the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Keep going and you will hit the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. And here's where Paul wants the focus of the church to be. With all these different little cliques focusing upon themselves, tearing the church apart, the book of Hebrews says this, 12 verse 2. Fix your eyes on who? Jesus. One more time. Fix your eyes on who? Jesus. Jesus. The pioneer and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, <coughs> scorned its shame, and sat down the right hand of the throne of God. And so the church is to gather around the cross of Jesus and to see that on the cross Jesus paid for our sins. Pay for the wrongs that we have done. And this leads us to our last point. And look what he says. For Jews demand signs, 
Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach what? Christ crucified. A stumbling block and folly, stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the what? Power of God. And so this is where we are to get our power from in this church. Our power is in the cross. And we focus on the cross. And in the cross we see our sinfulness and we see God's solution to our sin, His death on the cross. And so churches can be divided up into cliques where it's all about winning and pride. Churches can subtract from the gospel by adding to the flesh what the Corinthians church was doing. But look at a 3C there, and this is an equal quote. We exalt Christ, we lift up the cross, and become obscure in its shadow. Look at that again. We exalt Christ, we lift up the cross, and become obscure in its shadow. The love of Jesus flows best through a humble vessel that seeks to lift him up without having to be noticed. And so we as a community, it's not about us, we're about a different clique. It is about Jesus. It is about this cross that gives us power, that unites us all together as one family. I think Jesus said it best underneath there from John chapter 17. Read that with me. I pray not only for these followers, but also for those who will believe in me because of their teaching. Father, I pray that all who believe in me can be one. You are in me, and I am in you. I pray that they can also be one in us, that the world will believe that you have sent me. So it is all about living a life to give the glory of God. And all we do and all we say, and even in our conflict, it is about the cross and about God's mercy for us, we pray. Lord God, as some people here have been wounded, we'd ask you to help them with these wounds. We pray that you would heal them, that you would give them wisdom, that you'd help them always to seek Jesus Christ and to give him glory. In his name we pray. Amen.